Hi everyone! In this video we're going to be talking about Microsoft Word, which is the word processing software contained within Microsoft Office. So when I talk about word processing, let me actually define word processing for you. Way, way, way back in the day, uh, there used to be the printing press, the old-fashioned printing press where you would actually assemble letters onto a to, to essentially form a giant stamp you would just pre-assemble all of the letters with the thing that you were trying to print and then you would dip those letters in ink and then stamp them on the paper and that was how you printed a document but if you're trying to create multiple different types of documents this process is a little bit slow because you have to you have to go you have to assemble all of the letters for the first page print all of those pages that you want, and then you have to assemble, reassemble all of the letters for the second page and then print as many as you want and so on and so forth. And if you make a mistake, then you have to change everything that you've already assembled. So you have to move all the letters back around again. If you're on like page five or something and then you realize there's a mistake in page one, you either have to reassemble all of the letters on page one and then print everything again or you just ship it with a mistake and that's you know whatever so people ended up building machines that could actually put words or you know put letters onto a page one character at a time so that you could actually you know sort of type out a, a document that you're trying to work on and that's how we get inventions like the typewriter where you push down a certain key and you get a certain letter. The printing press was awesome for mass reproduction of documents. Inventions like the typewriter were really awesome if you only needed to make one of those. You only needed to make one page and you don't want to spend like five hours getting a printer ready to just make one page. So word processing when it comes to actually you know, automating certain aspects of creating a document has that very long and rich history. When it comes to computer technology, what we had originally were what we just call text editors. So you open up a text editor and you can press keys on the keyboard and just put in text. And this, these were very, very basic. And you can actually see what they look like if you open up something like Notepad on a Windows computer. All right, so here is Notepad. I can type in text, uh, test, 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 blah, blah. I can put in a tab and say blah, blah over here. You know, I can type in whatever, but really that's about it. If I want to make a numbered list, I have to actually like type in, you know, one, item one, two, item two, three, item three. So I actually have to type up the list by myself. If I want to control formatting, I actually have to do that by pressing space, 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 space. You know, I have to do all of that stuff very manually. I have to configure everything with a space and, you know, hopefully that the, the space is actually going to be the right size because if I can't get the space to be the right size, then I can't actually put everything in the right position. And all that kind of stuff. And then what if I want to italicize something or bold something, change the color, the font. Text editors didn't really have those features. So we kind of merged the two ideas. The idea of a text editor on a computer being something that lets you save text onto your computer and the idea of a word processor being automation, automating the creation of these documents with all of these kinds of features, like actually spacing things where you want them to be spaced, uh, bolding, italicizing letters, all of that kind of stuff. These ideas ended up getting merged into what we now know of as a word processor program. And that is the kind of stuff that Word is able to do. It started off with those features, you know, formatting the position of text, uh, the spacing between lines, all that kind of stuff. And it added more and more and more features, like putting in images, putting in graphics, all that kind of stuff. And that those features are what we're going to explore when we're talking about Microsoft Word in this class. All right, so I'm back in Microsoft Word, and this is the view that you're going to get when you open up Microsoft Word for the first time. Uh, when you open it up subsequent times, usually what it actually will do is it will open up the last opened document. Um, I'll show you how to come back to this view, or at least a view that's relatively similar. But this is what's known as 
the backstage view or the yeah this is the backstage view you have the home menu here which shows a few different options for what you can do you can create a new blank document if you want to start from scratch you can also start from a template now a template is a document that already has some stuff filled out uh, it's saved as actually a different file type than a docx um, you know, we talked about Word documents having the .docx file type last week, and templates have a different file type. The actual file type escapes me. Um, if I find it again, I will include it in this lecture. But what happens is when Word opens up a template, it actually copies everything that's in the template into a new Word document. And then you can start filling in stuff in that template. So I'll, I'll show you what it looks like to open up a template later on in the video. But right now I want to continue touring this sort of backstage view. So we have the option to create a new document, the option to start from a couple templates. You have this recent view right here, which shows you documents that you've recently opened. You can see that I have recently opened this document called lorem ipsum .docx. You also have a pinned tab. If you have documents that are really important to you, you can pin them. The way you can do that is in this recent view, you can right click. Uh, oh, it doesn't actually show my right click. One second. Okay, so I'm recording my entire desktop, which means that you should see it when I right click. Perfect. When you right click, you can actually see this pin to list option. When I pin to the list, you'll see this pin icon appear. And when I go to the pinned menu, you can see that it shows that I have pinned lorem ipsum .docx and I can access it super easily at any time. You also have this shared with me. Uh, you can see that I have a distance education guidelines document shared through me. This is going to actually connect to any documents that are shared, to, shared with you through your Alan Hancock uh, Outlook account if you use that to download Microsoft Office 365, and if you signed into Microsoft Office 365 with your My Hancock email, you'll, you'll see any documents that were shared to you through your emails. Now, the next thing in this menu is the new option. If you click this right here, you get all sorts of things that you can play with. So you get the option to create a blank document again, but you get a lot of templates, even more templates than you actually saw in the home menu right here. You only saw, what is that, seven, eight? I swear I can count, that's eight. Here you have a whole bunch of documents here and you have the option to search for online templates in case uh, you, you're not sure that any of these work for you. So let's say I wanna find some resume templates. I can type in resume like so and we'll search for all of these possible templates that you can use for your resume. And any sort of document that you want to make, if you want to use a template in order to help, you know, help get you started with something that looks relatively nice and that you can just type in information into in order to just, you know, have something done, then you can totally do that. But the idea of this course is to actually show you how to make all of this type of stuff. You'll be able to actually make documents that look like this. You could even possibly make your own templates for you to use for all, all kinds of things. A great idea of, you know, when you would want to use a template is if you're working at a company and you want to make a memo template so that every time you write a memo, you know, you have a very standardized header with all the information that you need to include in that memo, you know, your company name, the date, today's date, all of that kind of stuff. You can include that in your memo template. And then whenever you want to make an actual memo, you can open that memo up and then just start typing. You can open that template up to create a new memo and just start typing in the actual contents of the memo. So that's where templates actually come in handy. The other option that you get from this view of Word right here is open. And you can open all kinds of stuff. So you have all the recent documents here. You have shared with me. You can access your OneDrive. You can access the sites. Uh, there's also the other location. So this PC and browse uh, this PC 
actually op you know shows you all of the files in I believe this is your documents folder underneath your C drive by default that's I'm pretty sure the kind of stuff that's in here and if you browse this actually opens up a file explorer window for you to um, not a file explorer window it opens up a dialogue for you to search through your files and I'm not going to actually click that I'll leave that for you to do yourself all right, so first off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to create a new document with Word. It is as easy as just clicking this blank document button right here, and you are presented with a blank page. So congratulations, you have created a new document. Now, what I want to do is I want to take a brief tour of all of the features that Word kind of offers you right here just from looking at this blank document. First off, we have what's known as the Quick Access Toolbar. This area right here at the top left of my screen. This gives you very quick access to some really helpful features like autosave. What autosave does is it saves copies of the document that you're currently working on into your OneDrive account. So it saves it into cloud storage, cloud storage meaning you know, it's sort of like physical storage on your computer, but it is only accessible through online servers. So OneDrive is Microsoft's cloud storage where you can ac you can use it sort of like uh, a folder on your own computer. It's just located on Microsoft servers where they can peep into the actual files that are contained on there. But yes, if you want to have your documents saved periodically, and this doesn't actually count as like actually saving your document to your computer. What this does is this saves backups to OneDrive in case, say, your computer runs out of battery uh, out of nowhere or your computer shuts down out of nowhere because your desktop was plugged into the wall and you lost power or something like that. That's where autosave can be helpful. You click this toggle right here. It will ask, how do I turn on autosave? Just upload the file, we'll save your changes as they happen. You'll have to actually uh, go through the process of signing into OneDrive and then choosing where that file is going to be stored. Once you do that, then you'll actually have those saves uh, backed up periodically. So the way you would actually set this up is if you're turning on autosave, you would click you know, assuming you've already signed into Microsoft Office on your computer, which I believe the instructions that I gave you to set up Microsoft Office on your computer, uh, I, I believe those should have walked you through that. Once you have all of that set up, what you would do is you would click OneDrive Alan Hickok College, and then you would just give a name to, to your document. I'm just gonna call it blah for now. This will save as blah.docx on OneDrive. It'll just give you this naming your document dialog. Upload a copy of the document and then it will automatically save changes for you. I, I believe it's every few seconds or so. It, it saves it pretty often and pretty quickly. And of course, you know, this autosave part only really applies to if you have Microsoft Word downloaded on your physical computer. If you're accessing it online through, uh, you know, through the Alan Hancock portal, uh, you won't have to worry about this because your uh, saves will, your changes will just be saved no matter what. So don't worry about this autosave part if you're not, uh, if you don't actually have Microsoft Word running on your computer. So this is a toggle, which means that when you click it once, it turns on and you can click it again and it will turn off. I click autosave to toggle it on and I click autosave to toggle it off. You can think of this as sort of like sliding a switch over to the right and then over to the left. You know, slide it to the right to turn on, slide it to the left to turn off. Now, next to the uh, autosave button is the save button. The save button is really important when you're working on uh, a document on your actual computer. So. If you're using Microsoft Word on your computer rather than using it online in your web browser, 
you'll want to be saving your document very frequently. And that's why they actually give you this save button up here. So if I type anything in here, blah, 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 blah. Right now, I don't actually have autosave enabled. So if Microsoft Word were to suddenly quit, none of these changes that I have made to my document would actually be saved. And I'd have to redo all of that work over again. Now, imagine the same situation, except I spent two hours writing up the, the first chapter of the next great American novel and oh, this is going to be it. This is going to be what propels me into fame and fortune and all of that. I have never written a better first chapter and Microsoft Word crashed and I don't remember what I did. Oh no. Uh, the moral of the story is that you should always save your documents periodically. You can do that by pressing this button right up here and it saves your document. Another way you can do this, you might have actually noticed this. In the dialog that pops up when you hover over the save button, you can see this control plus S right here. Now, this is a keyboard shortcut. I talked a little bit about keyboard shortcuts in the last video when we were talking about, you know, cutting and pasting and undoing and redoing, uh, moving files and folders around and all that kind of stuff. A keyboard shortcut, when you want to use the save keyboard shortcut, you can press and hold the control button on your keyboard. And while you're holding control, if you press S, it will save your document. So you don't even have to move your mouse. If I make another change, halb, I'm gonna type halb instead of blah this time. If I want to save it immediately, I can type control S. And that has saved the document. You can see up here, saved. The saved means that it has been saved. And it actually, if you hover over the name of the document and the saved thing, it will say the document was last saved just now. So it gives you actually um, how long it's been since you last saved it. And if I make more changes again, you'll see that the saved has gone away. So if you look up here and you see that the word saved is not present, that means that you haven't saved your document, and you probably should, just in case. So control S, saving, saved. So that's a really helpful tool there. The next trick that I wanna talk about is the undo button. So we talked about undoing in the last video. I was talking about how you can copy and paste something or you can move something or something like that in File Explorer. And then if you want to undo what that action that you just took you can type Control z or hit undo and windows will essentially revert that change well you can also do that in microsoft word so if i want to create a new line let's say and then i'll say um this is a test line that will be undone you'll see that we have this arrow up here that will say undo typing. And you can click it and it will undo a portion of the work that you just did. I'll click it again. What that did was it undid the auto capitalization of this. Now, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but Word actually has a feature called autocorrect where if you make a grammar mistake, like not capitalizing the first word of a sentence or something like that, it might, or if you make a very common spelling mistake, it might actually correct that for you. So that, you know, the idea is that you don't have that mistake on your final draft. So if I type in this and then space is space. Oh. Let me actually try typing in something new really quick. Test sentence here uh all right this there we go so i typed in this all lowercase and then i pressed space and word realized hey the first letter of a sentence was not capitalized so it actually capitalized that first letter for me anyway uh yeah so you can undo the autocorrect 
And actually, if you hold your mouse over the undo button, you can actually see what it's about to undo. So I can hold my mouse over undo and it will say undo autocorrect. And if I want to undo the autocorrect, I can type, or I can press that undo button and it will be undone. So what if I've undone something, but I actually really do want it to be there? Well, that's where redo comes in. This is the redo button right here. You can click redo and it will essentially undo the undoing. So it will actually, you know, redo the change that you had made that you had then undone. It puts that change right back. Now you can undo a whole lot of times. Um, you know, if you click this arrow right here next to the undo key or the undo button, it actually shows all kinds of things that you're able to undo. And if you click, say, this option down here, it will undo everything up until that option included. So if I uh, want to actually put uh, blah, all that blah stuff back, I can click this and it undoes the document until it takes me back to the point where I have blah, 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 how blah, blah, blah on there. Now there's one more feature that I want to talk about uh, in the quick access toolbar, the stuff that's up here, which is if I type in some something, let's say this is a test sentence. You'll notice where the redo button normally is, you actually have this repeat typing button. Because I haven't undone anything yet, redo isn't really necessary, so it kind of gets replaced by this repeat typing thing. And if I click that, you'll see that it has essentially just repeated the last action that I did. And I can keep on clicking that, and it will keep on repeating this as a test sentence over and over and over again. And if I undo, you'll see that repeat typing gets replaced by redo. Uh, also, of note, uh, we can talk about keyboard shortcuts again. Undo typing uses Control Z as the keyboard shortcut. So I press and hold Control, and while I'm holding Control, I press Z. And that's the same keyboard shortcut as undoing in File Explorer. And Redo also shares the same uh, keyboard shortcut as with File Explorer, which is Control Y. So if I undo something, and I want to redo it again, I can type control Y and I have redone the change. The repeat key also has the keyboard shortcut control Y because it essentially replaces itself. It replaces redo with itself when you don't actually have anything possible to redo. So if I say, I will repeat this sentence and then press control Y. Oh, well, in this case, it just repeats intense. Uh, Word can be a little bit uh, confusing about what it's actually undoing and redoing sometimes. So it will also be a little bit uh, confusing about what it's repeating. I don't personally typically use the repeat function very often. I use undo and redo quite a bit. They're probably some of the more useful commands for me. So if you ever make a tiny mistake, you can just hit Control Z, or I mean, even if you make a big mistake, you can hit Control Z and that mistake should be undone. And if it's not undone yet, you just keep on hitting Control Z until you get to a point where you can no longer hit Control Z. And if the mistake still isn't resolved by then, uh, that's usually where the crying begins. All right, so also at the top of the screen is this search bar right here. And this is really helpful. Actually, it searches for, you know, a good number of people nowadays, but it can also search for commands within Word. So if I wanted to insert a smart art graphic, and you'll actually learn how to do that in the textbook reading, but if you wanted to search up the command to insert a smart art graphic, you could search smart art and you'll get insert smart up a smart art right here. And I can click that and it will give me the dialogue to insert smart art. I won't spoil the textbook for all of you. You'll learn how to do this stuff in the actual textbook reading. All right, the next concept that I want to talk about is the file menu. Now, if you press file, it takes you back to the view that we kind of started out the video with, or at least something a little bit similar to the view that we started the video with. So this is what's known as the backstage view. It gives you the home, new, and option 
stuff that you were able to see before, but it also gives you a whole bunch of things that are specific to the current document that you're working on. So you can get information about the document, including, you know, how to protect the document so you can actually protect it so that people can't make changes to it if you share it with other people. Uh, there's this com compatibility mode. Uh, that's, you know, really helpful if you're working with other people who might not have access to the newest version of Microsoft Office. If they have access to 2007 or something like that, you might have to convert your document to something that's compatible with Microsoft Office 2007. You can check it for issues to make sure that it has good metadata. Metadata is data about data. So metadata would be stuff like the author's name, you know, your, your name in the case of a document that you have made, uh, properties, the types of content in there. Uh, you can check it for accessibility as well. Accessibility in documents created by a word processor is super important because, um, you know, you have to worry about like, headers and navigation by someone who's using, say, a screen reader, it, you really want to make sure that, oh, uh, alt text as well, you know, alternate text for images for people who can't actually see your document. They want to have alternate text for your image in order to, so that they know what the image actually is describing and they won't miss out on needed context. So you can actually check for accessibility in here. And I'll probably make a video about accessibility in Microsoft Word. Uh, version history, you can actually view and restore previous versions of your document. And then you can have some document management options here. There's save and save as. These allow you to actually um, you know, save the document and you can save, you can click save as. When you click save as, this actually gives you the option to save your document under another file name. So what you'll be doing is you'll have, you know, I have blah.docx right now. I can click save as, and I'm going to save it into my OneDrive. I can save it as blah1.docx right here. And now you can see at the very top, we are currently working in blah1.docx. So blah.docx, we're no longer changing blah.docx. If I make changes in blah1.docx, this is a change that will only show up in blah1.docx. And I'll save that to blah1.docx. Now, if I open blah.docx, I can do that by clicking the file menu and going to open, and then blah.docx, We've opened up blah.docx and you'll see that that change that I had just made does not show up in blah.docx. So choosing save as allows you to save a copy of the document that you're currently working on under a new file name. And then you'll continue working on that copy of the document with the new file name, while the one that you were just working on will remain unchanged from that point on. The other options you've got in the file menu are saving as a PDF. Now, I'll, I'll be honest, This I don't know if this option is showing specifically because I have Adobe Acrobat uh, installed or not. You may or may not see this. Uh, your mileage may vary. Uh, but yeah, you can print the document. Uh, and what this actually does when you print it is it gives you what's known as a print preview right here. So, you know, here are all the options for actually printing the document, but you can also see what the document will look like in its final form when you have finally, when you're finally printing the document. Uh, you can share, so you can share it with people uh, through the, um, probably this will be through Alan Hancock's uh, Microsoft Outlook or Microsoft account stuff. So probably be able to share it directly from Word with someone in your contacts list. You can email it, send it to Adobe PDF for review, present it online, post it to blog. Like you have all these options that probably aren't the most necessary uh, because you could also just as easily attach it in an email or upload it to My Live IT or Canvas or something like that. But it gives you options. You can export it into different types of documents. I, I really think this uh, Adobe PDF thing is, it is. It's uh, specifically because I have Adobe Acrobat installed. If you actually want to 
export a Word document as a PDF, which is really useful if you want to, you know, export it as a document that no one else who will look at it will be able to really change or uh, export it in a very professional type of file format. Creating a PDF document is really good. You can also change the file type. So they give you a few different file types like the old fashioned .doc format. Oh, here we go. This is how you can make a template as well. So if you want to make a template, say a memo template for making, you know, this is what all your memos need to look like. And then you leave a little place for your uh, memo text to go into. This is what you can actually do is you can create that memo template and then save it as a template, a dot, dot X. And then there's some other file types as well. There's transforming. You can actually transform a Word document into a web page. Not that I would necessarily recommend doing that, but it's possible. You can do that using Microsoft Sway. We don't cover that in this class. That is something you would have to experiment with on your, on your own. And then finally, you can close the file menu just like that. All right, so I've already done a little bit of typing inside a Word document. I want to uh, get into a little bit more detail when it actually comes to, you know, how you can use your keyboard to interface with a Word document. So I, I uh, and, and also your mouse. So if you want to type at a very specific area, what you'll see right here is this blinking line. This is what's known as the cursor. I, I believe there's another name for it. I, I believe uh, my MATLAB IT will call it the insertion point. Cursor, uh, insertion point, they, they mean the same thing. So when you're typing, your first letter is going to show up after the insertion point, and the insertion point will move to after that first letter. So if I press the T key on my keyboard, then the insertion point moves to after the T, and then if I want to press A, I'll know that A will show up after the insertion point, which means that it will show up after the T. And then the insertion point gets moved back after the A that I've pressed. If I want to get rid of a key that I've just typed, I press backspace. Or if you're on a Mac, it might be delete. If you're on a Chromebook, it might also be delete. I, I don't remember for sure. But you can press either the backspace or delete key. On Windows, it's the backspace key. So. I'll refer to it as that. I'll press backspace and then I'll press backspace again. And that is how you actually get rid of a key. Now, if you want to start typing at a specific place in a document that's not where the insertion point currently is, you have a couple of options. The first thing you can do is you can use the arrow keys to move the insertion point. So I'll press the left arrow key on my keyboard and you'll see that the insertion point is now between E and period, meaning that if I type a character here, it will show up between the E and the period. And I press, uh, I'll press E again, and you'll see that a second E has been placed between the first E and the period. And I'll press backspace. Backspace always gets rid of the character directly to the left of the insertion point. So if I press backspace again, I've gotten rid of the E uh, that was originally part of sentence and I'll press E again and sentence is now spelled right. But yeah, I can press left, I can press right, and that will move the insertion point left and right. Uh, it will move it once for every time that I press the arrow key, or if I press and hold the arrow key, it will just move it a whole bunch. And that actually works for any key as well. If I press and hold, let's say the eight, the, uh, R key, you'll see that a whole bunch of R's are being typed even though I've only pressed one key. So that's what happens when you press and hold. Let me undo that. There we go. You can also move up and down. When you move up, you go up a line. And when you move down, you go down a line. Now, important to note is if the second line here is actually longer than the first line. So if I'm in a part of the second line that is sort of further out than in the first line. If I press up, the insertion point will just move to the end of the line above it. And then if I press down, it will move back to where it was. The other way that you can reposition the insertion point is by clicking. So if I want to type a word between test and sentence, I can move the insertion point 
All right, I can move my cursor before the S in sentence. And you can see that my cursor, or you know, my, my mouse uh, has, I, I, I can move my mouse between test and sentence directly to the left of the S in sentence. And you'll notice that my mouse now actually looks like a cursor um, or like, like the insertion point. So I can click and the insertion point will move right there. And then I can type in another word, silly. This is a test silly sentence, something like that. So you can click around to actually, you know, put the insertion point wherever you want. So we talked about using backspace to remove keys to the left of the insertion point. Right now, the insertion point is between an L and a Y. If I press backspace, it will get rid of the L. Now let me put that back. What happens if you want to remove the character to the right of the insertion point? Well, what I could do is I could press right, the, you know, the right arrow key, and then backspace. But that's two key presses. What if I wanted to do it in one key press? Well, on Windows, you have the delete key. The delete key actually works the same way as backspace, but instead of erasing everything to the left, it's going to erase everything to the right. So I've just erased the Y, I erased the space, S-E-N-T-E-N-C-E. -E -E -E. So backspace erases to the left, delete erases to the right. If you're on a Mac, I believe you have to type, you have to press and hold the function key, F-N, and then delete in order to actually get the same functionality because on Mac OS you have delete but not backspace. And on Windows you have backspace and delete, but the delete on Windows works differently than the delete on Mac. If you're on Chrome OS, I don't know what it is. You might have to press that search key and delete in order to get this functionality, but I don't know off the top of my head. If you're on Linux, who even knows? But uh, you know, if you're on Linux, it actually it just depends on what keyboard you're using. Regardless, that is deleting. All right, so now what I've done for the next set of examples is I have opened up a document with a lot of text on this. This is actually a whole bunch of garbled Latin that graphic designers typically use as what's known as placeholder text. Text that is temporary that you will eventually replace with actual meaningful text. What they'll do is they'll put this lorem ipsum delor uh, type of stuff on like a website so they can see what it looks like when that website actually has text in it, but they don't actually have to create like meaningful text in order to see what the website looks like with text on it. In this case, I just wanted to fill out a whole bunch of space and put a whole bunch of words in a Word document. So, so it's, it's broken Latin. It did used to have meaning. You can look up the story of lorem ipsum on Wikipedia if you're interested. It's actually relatively interesting. But I wanted to have a whole bunch of text to talk about the next set of functionalities. So if I'm in the middle of the line and I want to go to the, to the beginning, I can hit the home key and suddenly the insertion point is at the beginning of the line. And you'll see that you know, I'm typing in characters and at the beginning of the line. If I want to go to the end, you have the end key. And now I'm at the end of the line. And because I'm at the end of a line that actually takes up the whole you know, document. If I, start if I start typing, I'll end up on the next line. But if I go to the very last line of this current paragraph that I'm on and I hit end, then when I start typing, you'll see that all of that text shows up at the end of that line. Um, which actually uh, does bring me to another key term right here, which is how words in a paragraph sort of wrap around. So if I'm working on a line, test, 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 blah, 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 I am typing so many words. You know, I'm about to say I am typing so many words, but I've reached the end of the document. You know, I, I've reached the end of the usable space and we're about to sort of move on to the next line, sort of like what a typewriter does, if you're familiar with how a typewriter does. So if I keep on typing text, the words are going to wrap around onto the next line of text just like that. And Word makes it happen automatically. When it senses that you're 
getting close to the end of a margin, it will um, it will actually bring you around to the next line. Now a margin is actually this white space right here. It's actually the lines that define this white space. So you have the left margin right here that says, you know, your text will only go, will we'll start at this point of the document. And then you have the right margin. Your text will end at this point of the document just about. It, the text will no longer, will not go past this sort of imaginary line on the document. Actually, if you want to see the margin lines for yourself, what you can do is you can click view right here and you'll see this ruler checkbox. When you check it, that means that you have turned it on. When you click it again, you will uncheck it and that means you've turned it off. So when I click it to check it, you'll actually see the ruler, which shows you know how large is this document and where are the margin lines showing. And right here, this is the left margin. This is the right margin. Words will not go past the right margin. And if a if typing out a full word, you know, when, when you're typing out the word, if it gets interrupted by the margin line, word will actually move it down onto the next line when you, you know, by default. Uh, and then you'll also see the top margin like this, which shows how far down the page you start and oh, the bottom margin right here. So that's margins. You'll learn more about them through the textbook work. Okay, so we talked about uh, using home and end to go to the beginning and the end of a line, but you can also uh, use keys to travel within a line relatively quickly. So like, let's say I'm trying to, I'm right here between dictum and sit, and I'm trying to go all the way to this, uh, I'm not gonna pronounce this well, gravida uh, word right here. You can click the arrow keys a whole bunch which is just going to take forever. Or you can move your hand to the mouse to click Gravida just like this, but then you're moving your hand away from the keyboard over to the mouse and then back over to the keyboard. And if you do that a whole bunch, it's inefficient. Your hand might get sore, all that kind of stuff. Another thing you can do is you can press and hold control and then the arrow keys. And if you do that, you'll go to the beginning of the next word. So I'm in between, or I'm in front of anim. Now I'm in front of DM. Now I'm between DM and the period. Now I'm in front of in. Now I'm in front of Hendry Rit. Absolutely pronouncing that wrong. Gravida, Rutrum, and so on and so forth. And you can do the same thing with control left. You also have control up and control down. Control down brings you to the beginning of the next paragraph. And control up brings you to the beginning of the previous paragraph. So those are really quick navigation options just using your keyboard. Uh, a couple quick other keys that are really helpful. You have the tab key, which can do stuff like indent. Uh, it will actually bring whatever text uh, your cursor is in front of over to what's known as a tab stop point. And the tab stop is something that you would define within Word. You'll learn how to do that in the textbook. But you can use that to actually indent your documents super easily, just like that. You can indent the first word of a paragraph. Also, if you're typing a paragraph and you decide, hey, I need to start a new paragraph, you can press enter and you will have started a new paragraph. So enter brings you down to the next line, just like that. The next thing I want to talk about is the formatting marks. Now, formatting marks, uh, there's a lot of invisible characters when you're looking at Microsoft Word. Space, for example, is an invisible character. You can't actually see a space. You only know that a space is there based on the, well, space between the actual visible characters. Another example is tab. You can see that there's space right here before the word lorem, but you can't actually see the tab key. 
And the last invisible key here is enter. So when I press enter, you'll know that everything has, you'll notice that everything has shifted down, but you can't actually see the enter yourself. If you want to see all of those, you can click this show hide formatting marks toggle button. It's a toggle button because it is a button that you can toggle on and off. So I've, to I've pressed it, it is on. I can toggle it again to turn it off, on, off, on, off, etc. But when you show the formatting marks like this, you'll see that line breaks, which are what you insert when you press the enter key, sh are shown up as this weird little backwards P sign. That's the, the symbol for a line break. A space is shown by a little dot between two letters. So this little dot right here is a space. If you press tab, there we go. A tab is shown by an arrow, just like this. So when you see a tab between two words, an arrow between two words, when you have show hide formatting on, that's when you know that someone has pressed the tab key. And I'm going to turn this back off again because it's quite a bit of visual noise. However, you'll be using the uh, show, you'll be showing the formatting marks when you're actually doing your simulation training slash your assignments for um, the actual Microsoft Word stuff. Now, what's important to note is that I have the f formatting marks shown right now, but if I go to print preview by clicking file and then print, you'll see that the formatting marks don't actually show up in the print preview. So those only show up when you're working in Microsoft Word. When you share the file with someone else, or when you print it or convert it to a PDF or email it to me or submit it to my MATLAB or my lab IT or something like that, I won't see it. Or, you know, anyone that you share the document won't see it unless they also enable formatting marks. So they're invisible except for when you're actually working in Microsoft Word. All right, so here's another cool feature. Um, you can select things, you can select words in a word processor in the same way that you're able to select files in File Explorer. So when you select words like this, what I'm doing right here is I'm using my mouse, I'm clicking and I am dragging like this. So let's say I want to get rid of blah, blah, blah. I can select blah, blah, blah. And you'll see that I have started my selection at the letter B and it ends at the space between the final blah and the word I. Now, if I want to get rid of it, I can press backspace and it will be gone. Or here, I'm, I'm going to uh, undo that and you'll see that when I undo, my selection is still there along with the actual um, text, blah, blah, blah. If I want to type something instead of blah, 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 when I have it selected, I can just start typing. Blah, blah, blah will be removed and it will be replaced by whatever I'm typing. So this text replaced blah, blah, blah. Just like that. Another way that you can select text is using your keyboard. So if you, let's say now I want to select test, test, test. So I'm going to use control and arrow keys to go to the beginning of the word this in this text replaced. What I'm going to do is I'm going to press and hold shift and then use the arrow keys. And you'll see that I am selecting the words test, test, test using only shift and the arrow keys. Now, if I shift in the other direction, you'll see that I am decreasing the amount of selected area. If I shift back to the left again, I'm increasing the amount of shifted area. You can also shift in the other direction. So now let's say I want to get rid of this text replaced blah, blah, blah. I can press and hold shift and just keep on going to the right. And now I'm selecting in the right words direction, like so. You can combine con you can combine the functionality of control plus the arrow keys with the functionality of the shift plus arrow keys to increase or decrease your selected area by entire words. So if I press control and shift and then hold the arrow keys, 
you'll see that the selection advances or retreats one word at a time. So I can start at the first word test in this line and I can press and hold control and shift and then write and that will just start selecting words one word at a time. Another thing you can also do is you can press and hold shift and end in order to select everything from where your cursor currently is, so in this case between the P and the L of replaced, and the end of the line, like so, or the beginning of the line, like so. And there's, there's just a lot of really nifty tricks to actually selecting text if you want to replace it or just delete it. And if you want to get rid of a selection, you can either click anywhere in the document like that, or you can press the arrow keys like that, and it will get rid of your selection without deleting anything. So now that we have talked about selection, I can talk about the next feature, which is copying and pasting or cutting and pasting. We talked about this again in File Explorer, but it's also a feature that you can use in Microsoft Word. And actually, we'll be able to use uh, copying and pasting in all of the Microsoft Office suite. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this whole line. And let's say I want to put it between the second and third paragraph of this lorem text. So I, I guess this would actually be the third and fourth paragraph of the document. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this whole thing. I'm going to right click and you have this whole right click menu right here that lets you do a whole bunch of stuff. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select copy. And then because I want to put it between these two paragraphs of let's say I want to make it its own paragraph. I'm going to go to the end of the third paragraph, press enter to create a new paragraph and then I'll right click again and you'll have the paste options. Now the paste options are as follows. You keep the source formatting. Actually, let me show you what that looks like. So I'm going to make this text red. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to come up here to the ribbon menu. I'll talk about the ribbon menu in a sec. I'm going to click just this font color uh, drop down menu right here. This gives you a whole bunch of colors you can choose from. I'm just going to click red and that will turn my selected text red. Now I'm going to select this whole thing. I'm going to copy by right clicking and clicking copy. And now between these two paragraphs where I want the text to go, if I look at the paste options, keeping the source formatting will keep the red text and any other text formatting you do, whether that's italics, underlines, bold, etc. I'll show those off in a sec. You can merge the formatting, which means that you'll make the text that you're trying to paste look like the text around it. So this will actually get rid of the red text because all the text around it is not red. There's this picture paste that doesn't really apply here because we're just copying text. And you can keep the text only. Uh, that would actually get rid of all formatting, including the formatting of the document around it. So what I mean by that is I'm going to select all of these pieces of text right here, and I'm going to make it italicized. Italicized means that it's sort of squiggly and a little bit fancy. So now if I merge the formatting, if I keep the source formatting, it would keep the red text like so. And any other formatting I did, I, I did when I made that line that I then copied. If I wanted to merge the formatting, it would get rid of the red text and it would italicize the text. If I wanted to keep the text only, well, it, it kind of works in this case, similar to merging, merging the formatting. The difference here is that if I merge the formatting, it enters another paragraph afterwards. And if I just keep the text only, it doesn't enter the paragraph afterwards. It just keeps the text and kind of makes it look like the document around it. The, the actual difference between the two, what's going on underneath the hood, I'll be honest, it's a little bit of a mystery to me. Sometimes when you're pasting, you actually have to go through these paste options and see what's right for you. I'm just going to keep text only. And now it looks like all the other parts of the document. 
Now let me get rid of the italicize stuff here. I can do that. Itali the italics are a toggle button, just like the show hide formatting button. So when I click that, it just gets rid of the italices again. Now, let's say I want to, instead of copying this line and putting it, let's say, let's say now I want this line between the, what is it? One, two, three, four, fifth and sixth paragraphs of the document right here. But I don't want to keep this text here. Instead, I want to completely move it. What I can do is I can right click and I can click cut. And just like when we were working in Microsoft Explorer and cutting a, a file, moved that file into a new position. When I cut it here, it's going to remove it from where it used to be. And then when I paste it, it's going to paste it where it was. Or, or sorry, not where it was, but where I want it to be now. Now, just like in File Explorer, the keyboard shortcut for copying is Control C. The keyboard shortcut for cutting is Control X. And the keyboard shortcut for pasting is uh, it's Control V. Okay, so let's talk about the ribbon menu. This right here is the ribbon menu. It's always out by default. I, I believe it's always out by default. If you don't want it to be always showing, you can click this arrow, this little up arrow at the very right of the ribbon menu, and it will go away by default. And then if you want to access the ribbon menu again, you just click one of these menu options and it will bring the ribbon menu back out. And then when you click away, that menu will go away again. You can pin the ribbon if it is not visible by default and you want to keep it open, you can pin it and the ribbon menu will stay open. Now inside the ribbon menu, you have these different categories, home, insert, draw, design, layout, and so on and so forth. And you will learn what all of these are as we go through the word curriculum. And you'll also see a ribbon menu in Access and Excel and PowerPoint. Inside of the ribbon are ribbon groups. So this clipboard thing right here is a ribbon group. It's a group within the ribbon. Font is a ribbon group. The font group controls the actual font of the document. So the font being like what the letters actually look like you can change the fonts to make the letters show up differently like this. It also controls uh, different font styles. So if you want to make it bold, italicized, underlined, unbolded, unitalicized, ununderlined. You have different underline options, by the way, in case you want to double underline it or bold underline it or anything like that. You have the strike through option. You have subscript and superscript options right here. Uh, superscript will allow you to insert text sort of above, sort of like an exponent in math. Test, test, test. You can see that those are, the superscript is sort of above where the text normally would be. You also got subscript, which would put it below. Test, test, test. Uh, subscript and superscript sort of function like toggle buttons, but if you have subscript on and then you click superscript, subscript will automatically turn off. So they're, they're like quantum linked toggle buttons, essentially. Uh, you can also control the font size, so how large the font actually appears on the paper. All the way up here, all the way down here, and you can actually type in your own value as well. So if I want a font size of 2, you can get something real small. Uh, you can change the case as well, so the case being uppercase, lowercase. You can make it all lowercase, all uppercase, capitalize each word. Toggle case, which inverts the actual case that you actually have right here. So actually, I'll show you. Yeah, all the uppercase letters become lowercase and vice versa. And you have other options right here. 
Now, another important vocabulary uh, piece in Microsoft Word or Microsoft Office in general is a gallery. So some of these options right here, you'll see have these little arrows. When you click a button like this, it will open up a gallery that gives you all the different options along with a little associated preview of what that might look like. So orientation or columns or margins or anything like that, that's opening up a gallery. While I'm on the topic of orientation, you can change whether or not your page is in portrait, which is sort of the, the tall way, or landscape mode, which is kind of like sideways a little bit. That's document orientation right there. All right, so throughout my video, you'll have seen a couple of lines underneath some areas of the text that I've typed. Uh, for example, the red squiggly line right here or the blue double underline right here. And when I hover over these words, the red squiggly aligned word will have a sort of red highlight and the blue underline words right here will have a blue highlight. Now this is Microsoft Word telling me that I have a spelling error in the case of the red line or grammar error in the case of a blue line. Now, the way that Microsoft Word is able to you know, figure this out is through its editor program. So if you go to review in the ribbon menu and then under the proofing group, click editor, you'll actually have this whole menu come up. You'll see the editor score, which is their AI's value. You know, they, they assign you a value for how well your, um, your document meets their perceived notions of spelling and grammar, correct spelling and correct grammar. And, you know, I'll be honest, I wouldn't pay too much attention to that. Uh, right here, you can actually see this formal, professional, or casual option right here for your writing. And that actually tells Word how strict it should be with your spelling and grammar checking and all that kind of stuff. But the, the editor essentially tries to check your grammar and spelling. What it used to be back in the day was they had a whole list of rules that if your document didn't follow those rules, it would underline in one of the colors. And now they have some AI, so it's a little bit more nebulous as to what it's doing. But what they'll do is they'll give you a score, they'll give you some insights, some refinements that you could do to make your document better, like. Uh, punctuation conventions, inclusiveness. I actually am very curious how they measure stuff like inclusiveness and sensitive geopolitical references because this actually gets into a huge amount of AI ethics discussions, especially at like you know the the graduate college level. I'm sure people could be writing papers about this kind of stuff and. Microsoft is just including it in their editor. I'm very curious how they go about determining that. So if anyone happens to have any ideas about that, let me know. Regardless. What you'll, what you'll really want to know is the corrections area, the spelling and grammar corrections. So I'm going to, to first address the spelling correction. And you'll see the sentence, the offending sentence highlighted. It gives you the option to actually read it out. Uh, and it gives you suggestions for how you could change it. So maybe it doesn't know exactly what word you're trying to use. Um, you could, it might have multiple word suggestions just to say, you know, if that's not the right word to be using, then uh, maybe the next suggestion is or so on and so forth. Now, let's say you're writing the next great fantasy novel and you know, you're trying to be the next JRR token and you have all these wild fantasy names and Microsoft Word doesn't actually recognize those names. Uh, also, another example of this is maybe you're typing in Spanish and maybe Microsoft Word is having a hard time understanding that you're typing in Spanish and is trying to apply English dictionary rules to your Spanish. Um, at least that, that did used to be the case back in the day. I don't know if that is anymore off the top of my head. Regardless, you have options for ignoring things. So you can ignore once 
which means that this one time Microsoft Word will be okay with using sentence uh, sentence spelled wrong, but every other time you use this exact spelling, Microsoft Word will be like, okay, well, this is a bad word, a, a misspelled word, you should correct this. Ignore all will say, hey, just every time I type in S S E N T A N C E, sentence like that, just don't worry about it. And Microsoft Word will say, okay, I won't worry about it. Now, these only persist until you, like, as long as you have Microsoft Word open. If you close it and open it again, and you've just clicked the ignore once or ignore all options, uh, that will be erased and Microsoft will forget about that. So if you want to make it permanent, you would add it to the dictionary. You would tell Microsoft, hey, this is a new word, cool new word, you've never heard of it before. Uh, treat this as a correct word. In this case, I spelled it wrong, so I'm just going to click sentence. And that's done. Now you can take a look at the grammar. Um, it will give you suggestions of grammar. Um, and also another thing is that you can read aloud or spell out their suggestions. In the grammar case, you can ignore an issue and you can also don't check for this particular issue. So if you have, if it recognizes this kind of issue again, where I have a comma in a weird place, it's not going to, uh, it, it might flag that again, but it won't check for this specific out of place comma. So I'm going to apply their suggestion because I think it happens to be a good one this time. And then you'll get the notification. You have finished reviewing editors suggestions. They used to call it spell check. Now, now it's just called editor because I guess they're giving you all of these refinements as well. Really, and we're getting into ethics a little bit here. I would be careful with their refinements because none of these are actually directly checked by humans. This is all trained by an artificial intelligence and it, you can get into some real dangerous territory if you're letting an artificial intelligence system actually control the way that you're communicating information or making policy in a document or something like that. I would trust yourself first and foremost here. And maybe listen to them with the actual corrections, with the spelling and grammar corrections, but with the refinements, just be real careful about it. All right, so let's say you want to change how large the document looks in your window. Right now it's pretty zoomed in, which is nice if you want to have an easier time looking at the text, but if you want to look at the page as a whole, it can look a little bit cramped. So you have this zoom area down here, and you can actually use this to change the zoom of your page. So there's a minus sign down here, and I'm going to click that, it zooms out. And when I click the plus sign on the right side, it zooms in. You can also use the mouse to control the zoom by clicking this little bar, zooming all the way in and all the way out like so. You also have some options in the view area of the ribbon. So you can snap it to 100%. This is, they, they call it 100%. It should be somewhat representative of what the document will look like when it's printed. It's about the same size as a piece of paper. Of course, this depends on the size of your actual device's screen. Uh, but you can zoom it straight to 100%. You can click this zoom button right here to actually, you know, this gives you a lot of different options right here. You can zoom to 200%, 75%. You can actually specify a specific percent. Page width, text width, whole page, many pages right here. Let's go through all of these. So page width, but you can also select page width with this button up here in the uh, zoom group of view. Page width will actually make the entire page take up the whole window. Sorry, the width of the page take up the whole window. So the left side of the page is at the left side of the window. The right side of the page is at the right side of the window. If you do text width, that actually zooms it in even further so that the left side of the text is at the left side of the window and the right side of the text is at the right side of the window. So the left edge and the right edge of the page are actually currently off the window. I can use these scroll bars to see 
that they are off to the side. By the way, uh, I have a vertical scrolling scroll bar right here. The scroll bar actually controls the position of the document in the window. Uh, you can also control the vertical scroll bar using the scroll wheel on your mouse or using a two-fingered scroll on your trackpad if you have a laptop like that. And if you want to know how to do a two-fingered scroll on your laptop, feel free to ask me in person. Uh, typically, you need uh, either to do a sideways two-fingered scroll on your laptop trackpad or to have a mouse with a special sideways scroll bar or a, uh, a scroll ball that lets you sideways scroll. Most mice by default won't actually let you scroll sideways, so that's just a note on scrolling there. Uh, the other option we have for Zoom is whole page, and that actually just shows you the entire page all at once in your window, and that's the same thing as clicking the one page button right here in the Zoom group. Now, something you can also do in the Zoom group is multiple pages. And that will let you see two pages at once, like so. And you can also access this multiple pages window by using this little zoom bar right here, just scrolling it past this little tiny horizontal line that uh, denotes where 100% zoom is. If you scroll it to the left of that, you'll get multiple pages showing up on the screen at once. And if you scroll it even further out, you can get like four or five, six pages showing up at once. So that just depends on how many pages you have in the document. At that point, you just get to the point of unreadability sometimes. So not a lot of use for that, but the option is out there. Also under Zoom is this many pages option. And you can click this little arrow and select how many pages you want to see at once using this little group right here. So when I select this, for example, two by two pages, what it's going to do is it's going to make a square of four pages. I'll actually show you. I'll make a square of four pages. This is the first page, second, third, and fourth. If I want them to all be laid out next to each other instead, I can do one by four. It's one column of four pages instead of two columns of two pages like we're seeing right now. One column of four pages looks like this. It zoomed in a little bit more just because I have a, uh, you know, a horizontal screen. So laying them out sideways is going to be a little bit better than laying them out vertically. Now, another cool feature is the split functionality. So if you go to view and then in the window group split, what you can actually do is split your current window into two. So I'll click split. There we go. And right here, what we have is we have the same document open in two different views, but I can scroll down here and make changes elsewhere in the document while still keeping the top part of the document in view. So this is really helpful if I want to reference whatever is over here later on in the document. So like if I'm trying to repeat a little bit of information and I want to make sure that I have that information correct, or if I'm like copying a bunch of stuff from up here and pasting it down here, this is where splitting the window can be really helpful. And you can also, you know, change the position of the top split and change the position of the bottom split. You can edit in the top split or in the bottom split. It's completely up to you how you use that. Another feature you can work with is the header and the footer of the document. So the header by default is going to be text that appears above the normal actual document typing area. And it's going to be text that appears on every single page of the document. So one of the ways that I can actually insert a header into my document is I go to insert and in the ribbon menu uh, under the header and footer group, I click header. This opens up a gallery with a whole bunch of different formats that I can work with. So I'm just going to click this blank one right here. And now this gives me some placeholder text, some text that's meant to show where the text I'm about to type will go, but it's meant for me to replace that text. And you'll, you'll see more placeholder text uh, when you actually start working with smart art and the like in the actual chapter activities. So 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to type, uh, I'll just type my name. So Iris Kohler. And if I want to get out of here, I can either double click the normal document area or I can press the escape button on my keyboard. And you'll see that now this text is grayed out. When I was working on the header, by the way, what I just did was I double clicked on the header of the document and that actually lets me edit the header again. So that's another way of working on your header is by double clicking the top of your document. Now, when I'm working on the header, you'll see that the document text is grayed out. But when I escape and start working on the actual document, the header text is completely grayed out. So that's how you know whether you're working on the actual document or whether you're working on the header and footer. Another way you can tell is if this header line shows, or this header box and dotted line show up. That's when you know you're working on the header. Now, if I scroll down, oh, if I scroll down, page two, my name shows up just as it did before. Page three, my name shows up just as it did before. Now I'm going to edit the header on page three. I'm just gonna write test now and double click out of there. And when I scroll back up, you'll see that it changed on page two and page one. So it doesn't matter what page you actually write the header on, it will always be the same on every single page by default. We can also talk about the footer. So I'm going to put in a blank footer like this. Blah. And hit escape. And now blah actually shows up as a footer. Now what's interesting is I'm going to double click the footer and I can work on the header and the footer at the same time. I can't work on the document when I'm working on either the header or the footer, but I can work on both the header and the footer at the same time if I so choose. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of the header and the footer real quick. And I'm going to now insert the page number. So when you click the page number, you get a menu. You can do it at the top of the page. That gives you a whole bunch of options the bottom of the page that gives you a whole bunch of options and so on and so forth. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put bottom of the page, middle and the center of the footer. And that actually puts a page number at the bottom of your document in the center. Now there might be reasons why you put it on the left or the right hand side at the top of the page, at the bottom of the page, in the margins, it gives you all of those different options and there's a lot more, customization. There's actually quite a bit of stuff you can put in the header and the footer, like the current date. You can have Word automatically put the current date in there rather than you having to update the current date. You can have the file name in your document and stuff like that. You'll actually learn how to do that in, I believe, Project 1B. You'll learn how to put in the file name and you should also get enough information from there to look at all the other cool things you can put in the footer or header of the document. So you'll, you'll learn more about that in the actual project, but I wanted to explain what the header and the footer actually are and talk about the page numbers. All right, so here's the last thing that I wanna talk about with Microsoft Word, and you'll, you'll learn more about this in the actual project, but I want to briefly introduce uh, lists in Microsoft Word. There's two types of lists. There's an ordered list and an unordered list. If you have a bunch of information that you're trying to present and you need, let's say I'm giving you some instructions. I need to present those instructions in an ordered format. So the best way to do that is by using an ordered list. So you would go to home inside of the paragraph group, you would click this one, two, three, thing right here, it would give you the option to create what they call a numbered list. Uh, the more colloquial term for it is an ordered list, but numbered list also works. And you'll see this number one show up automatically. I could type, you know, step one, and when I press enter, the next number shows up. Step two, when I press enter, the next number shows up. Step three. Now let's say I want to make, let's say step three has like 
five different sub steps that you have to complete in order to fully complete step three. What I can do is I can press enter and then tab. And when I press tab like that, now we're looking at step 3a, step 3b, step 3c, and so on. Step 3d, step 3e. Now, if I want to go back to the previous level to work on step four, I can press enter again. So what I did was I was at step E, I press enter twice, and instead of going to step F, it goes back to step four. Similarly, if I'm all the way down, you know, after A, B, C, D, and E, you get I, uh, step three E, I, step three E, I, I, and so on. If I want to get back, if I want to go back th uh, two levels, I would have to press enter three times in total. So enter, enter, enter. And that takes me back to step four. Now, another way that you can control what level of the list you're on is through these two little buttons up here. You can increase uh, your indent which takes you up to the letters and then the, uh, the baby Roman numerals. You can also decrease the indent to go backwards. And then if you want to stop working in a list, you can click the list button again and you'll stop working in the list. Now, if you're presenting a list of items or a, a list of things, but the order of those things doesn't actually matter, say you're not trying to do steps or anything like that, you're just presenting a list like a grocery list, let's say. You're presenting a grocery list and you don't care about the order in which you actually put the items into your basket. You could use what's known as an unordered list or bullets is what they call it. Unordered list is a more colloquial term. Bullets also works well. You click this and you get these little bullets. When you see bullets like this instead of numbers, that means that it is unordered. The ordering doesn't actually matter. So I could put them in carrots, milk, bread, uh, ground beef, four burgers. I'm Maybe I want to make burgers tonight, I don't know. All of these aren't ordered because it doesn't really matter what order I go through the store and put them in as long as I get all of them. So that is a unordered list. And similar to an ordered list, you can press tab or press this increase indent button to sort of make a sublist. The sublist in this case will have this little blank circle. And then again, you get like a square by default and so on and so forth. You're actually able to um, control what the shapes look like and you'll learn how to control what the shapes look like in, in the projects. So you can look forward to that. So that's an introduction to Microsoft Word. In my lab IT, you're going to learn quite a bit more about some of the features of Microsoft Word, not just in this week, but also, you know, all three weeks that we're going to be talking about Microsoft Word. So you can look forward to that. There, there, there are quite a few things that you can actually do. It's a pretty powerful software. It's been in development for multiple decades now. So really, really nifty piece of software. A lot of cool features in there. I hope you enjoy learning more about my about Microsoft Word through the simulation trainings and reading the textbook and doing your projects. So thank you all very much for watching.